It's my pleasure this evening to introduce our, our speaker. Uh, I first met Andre Weltman about 15 years ago while I was walking on some trails up at Camp Michaud, preparing for a, a, a walk that I would be leading for the Historical Society in a week or so. I noticed while there that there was a new footbridge across Tom's Run, and I thought, my, this, this is nice, we've got some help here. Um, and it was recently after, or soon after that, that I bumped into Andre and his wife Diane, and they were obviously the ones responsible for, for the footprint, footbridge. And that began a connection that has continued until this day. It was a surprise to learn, uh, after meeting him out, you know, chopping down trees and, and clearing trails, that he was actually a, a, a medical doctor working as a public health physician with the Division of Infectious Disease and Epidemiology for the Pennsylvania Department of Health. Another surprise to, uh, was to learn that this self-imposed mountain man was actually originally from New York City. He earned his MA from Harvard in 1982 and his MD from the State University of New York in Brooklyn in 1990. He completed his residency in internal medicine in St. Vincent's Hospital in New York in 1991, and then another residency in general preventive medicine, earning a master's degree there at Mount Sinai Medical Center in 1993. He then worked for the New York State Department of Health before coming to Pennsylvania. He has participated as a writer, writer in over 20 peer-reviewed publications I thought a few of these topics may be interesting to you. <laughs> Exposure to Borrelia, I'm probably not pronouncing any of this correct, correctly, Borre, Borrelia, Bergdorferi, and other tick-borne pathogens in Gettysburg National Military Park, <laughs> South Central Pennsylvania, 2009. <laughs> Self-limited febrile syndromes temporarily associated with the use of Propofol, I think you've heard that term before, associated with a famous American, for sedation in gastrointestinal endoscopic procedures. And the third one, multistate outbreak of listeriosis linked to turkey deli meat and subsequent changes in U.S. regulatory policy. So if you don't want to talk with Andre this evening about the history of Pine Grove, uh, you can engage him in, in some of those topics. In 2010, the Historical Society, in cooperation with most Michaud State Forest, began a project to enhance and improve knowledge about the former CCC and POW camp known as Camp Michaud. Andre was one of my most staunch supporters during that entire project and would show up almost every one of the work days chopping trees and clearing trails and additionally widening the path, the bridge over Tom's Run so that those people who were a little afraid of the, the foot wide path now had a two foot wide path to get across. At that same time in 2010 he became the founding board member of uh, the Friends of Pine Grove Furnace State Park and serves since then as its president. He is interested in the industrial archaeology of pine grove furnace and other 19th century charcoal iron furnaces. Every October at the State Park's Fall Furnace Festival, he leads a team of living history reenactors and making charcoal using the same methods that were used 200 years ago. My next uh, connection to Andre is in my role as uh, editor of the journal when he submitted two articles for publication in our journal. The first in 2012 was entitled The Mystery of the Unburned Mansion, The Loss of the Eggy Big House, and Other Fires at Pine Grove Furnace and Laurel Forge. The second, written in 2013, was entitled Civil War Troop Mo Movements at Pine Grove Furnace. He has also submitted articles for the Gardner, Gardner Digital Library, and a variety of brief history handouts, some of which you have copies of tonight, used during his public walking tours and presentations at Pine Grove Furnace State Park. His research is meticulous, well documented, and extremely well done. Andre and I have recently re served as consultants to a team of professional historians who were preparing a cultural assessment report for the South Mountain Initiative. 
Yes. During that time, they learned even more about his extensive knowledge gained about the history of the Pine Grove Furnace area. And I realized that this dinner would be an obvious time for him to share some of that extensive knowledge in a, in a very small way. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce to you Dr. Andre Weltman. So Linda, remind me, I have like two hours or three hours for this. <laughs> So thank you for that introduction. I should just say that the um, little bridge across Tom's Run in Canton Show was there so that I could walk my dog more conveniently because you couldn't do a loop until that bridge was in place. So the topic this evening is the park before the park, by which I mean before there was a state park at Pine Grove Furnace, or more technically appropriate uh, and correct, Pine Grove Ironworks. For the state park, there was another park there, an amusement park, and it's one of the least familiar stories of the history of that area. The prologue goes back to Jay Cook. Now, Jay Cook was once a very familiar name. No one knows who he is today, uh, but he was known across the country as the financier of the Civil War. He became the wealthiest man in the United States, at least in the North, I guess, uh, because he sold Union war bonds. And seeking to do something with all his money, even before the end of the Civil War, he started branching outside the financial sphere. And he ended up buying, among other things, two ironworks in New York State and here in Pennsylvania, Pine Grove Furnace. Um, Jay Cook, uh, as part of that uh, effort and that ownership, um, created a new company. He was always a shadow partner of this. You don't see his name very often in this phase, but it was definitely Jay Cook's involvement. And the company built the South Mountain Railroad, which had later names, um, from Carlisle to Pine Grove. In 1871, they brought in a new superintendent, uh, a guy originally from Massachusetts named Jackson Fuller, who had been involved in the iron and coal business in other parts of Pennsylvania and other places. So he came in originally just to help run this operation. However, in November of 1872, rather embarrassingly, Jay Cook had to sell the property because of what we would today call a cash flow problem, and uh, his financial difficulties associated with the Northern Pacific Railroad culminated in the collapse of his Wall Street firm in September of 1873, sparking an international depression, the Panic of 1873. Pine Grove Furnace sat idle for about four years, and interestingly, Jay Cook uh, was able to regain at least part of his prior wealth and one of the things he chose to do was repurchase the furnace there. Uh, this time, Jackson Fuller was a co-owner. They created another company. It was a joint stock venture, et cetera, but really Cook and Fuller were the two major owners. So now Jackson Fuller is an owner living there, uh, but they brought in someone else to be superintendent. In 1877 to 1878, during the winter, they made significant and really expensive improvements to the iron plant there. And I tell you this background because the idea that they were spending time and money to improve that iron operation is really stupid in a way. They knew this because they were facing Andrew Carnegie and the steel industry, and there was a real um, transformation, what's often called the second industrial revolution was going on at the time. So these small uh, charcoal-fired furnaces in the mountains were um, antiques, really. And it's amazing that they kept going for almost another two decades, give or take. So knowing that the writing was on the wall, Jackson Fuller looked for other productive uses for the South Mountain property. They had all this land, they had mineral resources, they had the forest, what would they do with it? And the three major activities were the amusement park, uh, the ice industry, and the brickyard um, a few years later. Now, the topic tonight is the amusement park. But I will say, as an aside here, that when I do tours and so forth at Pine Grove Furnace, when I mention these, most people have heard about the ice industry and the bricks because there's physical evidence of that. There are still uh, road names, street names in the park, uh, like Ice Cutters Lane and Ice House Road and so forth. Uh, there are places where you're literally stumbling over bricks near the former uh, brickyard area, which is now the State Park's Brickyard Pavilion. So those things are still remembered, but the amusement park is completely lost. And in fact, one of my long-term goals for the Friends someday is to get some kind of wayside marker um, as people walk past where it was because it's it just not indicated at all. So let's talk about Fuller's Amusement Park, or more properly, Pine Grove Park was its real name. 
I mentioned the South Mountain Railroad, and the railroad really is an important part of the story. This is from the memoirs written many years later by Horace Andrew Kiefer, who was the final superintendent of the iron operation. Basically, he took over Fuller's job while Fuller was still there uh, on a higher level. So Kiefer said, the railroad was the weakest part of our system. Not enough business could be supplied locally to balance the expenditures. So the railroad had really been created for commercial industrial purposes to haul things in and out of the iron industry and the forge. Uh, and the idea that they were now going to use it for passengers indicates how stressed they were. We laid out a park a half mile from the furnace, nammed up Mountain Creek for a lake. This was a roughly two acre uh, widening, basically, of Mountain Creek. It was only two feet deep, they claimed. Uh, it was right there in the channel of Mountain Creek. Put in a number of attractions and erected rustic buildings. With these diversions we had through the summer season daily, four to 10 coach loads of Sunday school and other organization with picnics. So the railroad is the reason for the amusement park. It's not that Jackson Fuller was going to be the precursor of Walt Disney or something like that. This was a money-making operation because of the railroad. So in 1878, they lay out this park. It was free, and that's also a rather strange and important part of it. So it was a free public park along the railroad line and also the channel of Mountain Creek. And I add some color here to an 1889 map. The goal was to bring paying passengers onto the railroad. And I left at your place settings a little reproduction of an 1881 ticket. Uh, and on the back, uh, penciled in the version that I found of this, had actually someone's name. And it was apparently written down that this was a used ticket. Um, so this was a 30-acre, roughly, give or take, 30 acres, flat area with multiple buildings, attractions, and activities. And you can see it. Um, actually, I've probably pulled this back a little bit. I think way off on the side of the room. Maybe a bit hard to see these slides. Um, so they had off on the east of this 1889 map the park indicated. And you'll notice that there's a uh, tongue of elevated land uh, stretching out here. So the park is separated by topography from the still active iron furnace. And that's part of the story that really amazes me. So they just upgraded the iron operation. It's still going. And at the same time, they've got a rustic attraction barely six tenths of a mile away. And it's convenient, I don't think it escaped their attention, that I guess some of the sound and whatever else because those operations were pretty noxious, that they've got it separated there. On a modern map, just to show you the perspective, here's the furnace, here's the ore pit, which is now, of course, Fuller Lake, and about a mile and a half, not quite that, Laurel Forge Pond, which is now Laurel Lake. On a modern state park map, if any of you have ever walked on the Copenhagen Loop Trail, uh, which is a little bit east of uh, Fuller Lake, and Pine Grove Furnace State Park, you've walked right through the middle of where this amusement park was. But there's no indication at all. Very few people have any idea it's there, even though they're walking through the middle of it. By 1880, they had over 21,000 visitors per year. The entrance, again, was free to excursionists. Excursionists meaning people who bought a day ticket on the railroad. There was a free public kitchen, and when each train arrived, they'd have boiling water ready in case people wanted to make tea, or I imagine boiling cubes for soup, the sorts of things you would bring to a 19th century picnic. There was a large pavilion. Uh, and other structures in case it rained. They made a point of uh, advertising that there was cover out there. Um, there was also, if you didn't want to do a picnic and wanted to pay for lunch, there was a restaurant and dining room run out of the mansion house of Carlisle. The promotional um, descriptions uh, mentioned there was a log cabin for ladies' toilet rooms. And this is described in, I have a reprint here from an 1881 uh, Cumberland Valley Railroad booklet describing this and other parks. So the ladies had a nice toilet room. I don't know what the gentlemen were supposed to do. <laughs> I guess there were trees there and you were expected to go behind them. <laughs> there were free entertainments. And again, they made a special point of saying, if you buy a railroad ticket, you can come to this free park. There's no extra charge for these activities, such as 10 pins alleys. There was a pair of them. 10 pins is bowling, OK. Flying horses, that's merry-go-round. Uh, there were boats on that little two-acre lake. I put it in quotes because it was just a widening of Mountain Creek, and I think it was uh, perhaps described a bit grander than it really was. There was, starting, I believe, in the early 1890s, a bicycle race track. And I find this particularly intriguing. I don't know where any of this was really in detail, but I don't know where the racetrack was positioned. I've seen a newspaper description years later that said it was above the park. Now, does that mean upstream or uphill? It could be either in this location. Um, and it was made of wood, and apparently remnants of it were still visible, at least through the World War II era. 
there was a 200 yard shooting range. So where did they put that? A little ways away so that it would be safe, I guess. And also so the noise would disturb people who came out to the countryside. Of course, if you live up there now, you know that there's plenty of shooting, especially at this time of year. <clears throat> and there was a baseball playing field, which was described as being right next to the railroad stop. This poses some problems, because if you go to that area now, where they must have had this playing field, it wouldn't have been much bigger than this room, really. Maybe a little bit longer, but this was not a full-sized uh, field, as best I can tell. So they were, they were playing it up just a little bit, uh, pardon the pun. And importantly, the 1881 description says, there were no intoxicating drinks of any character allowed to be sold within six miles. <laughs> what were they saying there? There weren't going to be outside rowdies coming in. And I think this was uh, what we would today call a dog whistle to all the wives and girlfriends to say, your man's not going to come out here and drink beer all afternoon. So um, this was a really nice attraction that they laid out. But there was something else you could do, and this was a way for them to make a little extra money. Um, you could learn the mysteries of iron manufacture, as they put it. One of, this is from uh, Superintendent Kiefer's memoirs. One of the Market Street Philadelphia Baldwin steam cars that operated during the 1876 centennial was purchased. And for a dime, people who had come out to this rustic setting could hop on this little self-contained uh, trolley, basically, and go back and forth uh, just a few minutes up to the furnace. Now, I gotta mention that the photographs uh, and, and drawing at the bottom here come straight out of Randy Watts' uh, book, Railroads to Pine Grove Furnace. Um, Randy, raise your hand, where are you? There you are. Um, 1991, it's almost a quarter century ago that you wrote that. That's kind of scary, isn't it? Um, so, it's a wonderful piece of work. And let me tell you, if you're not a rail fan, you should still take a look at this because Randy goes into a lot of this kind of history and gives you know this story and a bunch of other related stories. So it's not just about railroads. If you don't care much about locomotives, you can still get an awful lot out of Randy's work, and I really appreciate it. So uh, the 1876 centennial in Philadelphia was, of course, the United States showing its muscles to the international on the international stage. And there are several connections between Pine Grove Furnace and the Philadelphia Centennial Exhibition that I think is a, a fruitful topic for discussion in the future. So you could ride out to see this in operation, and as Randy pointed out, in the day before lawsuits, um, I, I guess they allowed that. Now you'd never allow the public to just wander over to the casting house. I mean, it's very dangerous. Let me take a moment to remind everyone that Jackson Fuller didn't come up with this concept of having people come out on day trips into the countryside. He didn't come up with this on his own. He was really copying other efforts of this type. And let me just mention a few of them in this area. Boiling Springs had several parks but in particular, the original Island Grove Park, I believe, goes back to around 1875. So that's a few years before Pine Grove Park, which started in 1878. Um, and these photographs are from one of the later trolley park uh, arrangements at Children's Lake. Um, but anyhow, Island Grove was before this. Caledonia, uh, mining and iron lands were used for recreation in the latter part of the 19th century, and partly because of the Brackenburg. Uh, in which was there. Uh, this photograph, though, is from the later years, in the very early 1900s, when the trolley came from Chambersburg. But again, the concept of having people come out to these industrial areas uh, or remote rural areas. Pine Grove, Jackson Fuller, I think, were often in friendly competition with Mon Alto. Uh, and the iron furnace there, in, going back to 1875, give or take, set up their own park. So again, that was before Pine Grove Park. And if you've been to the current state park, You've seen this um, picnic uh, pavilion, which is actually where their own flying horses, their merry-go-round was. And remember the shape, because you're going to see that shape again in a minute. Um, one of the other things about Monalto was that they had a shooting gallery. And at least according to this illustration, uh, it was a very short one. So the fact that Pine Grove put in a 200-yard shooting range was perhaps a little bit of one upsmanship. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Um, and a little bit later, just about the time that Pine Grove Park stopped operating, there was a park at Mount Holly and the gap there, roughly where the Deer Lodge is and roughly uh, that area. So this wasn't a new concept that Jackson Fuller did at Pine Grove Park, but I think from all descriptions, he pulled it off really well. So what can we say about what it looked like? And by the way, this is a poster that was uh, reprinted and for some years was sold at History on High. Uh, during the 2012 special exhibition, and y'all should reprint it because I think it's completely sold out from History oh, on High. We have some. So if, if there are, there are, I was there a few months ago and didn't see any. 
Um, so this is it, and it, it's a very nice poster, and uh, I'll talk about it more in just a moment. So what can we say about what it looked like at Hunt Grove Park? Well, it's tempting to look at the promotional materials that they put out, uh, and the little pamphlet is utterly useless. There's this stock image, really, of people playing in the dirt or having a picnic or whatever they appear to be doing, but it tells us nothing about the actual park. Of course, then I went to Richard Trait and his crew at the photo archives, and they were kind enough to sit me down and let me <coughs> scroll through all of the images. Unfortunately, the vast majority of them are kind of like this. They're groups of people out for their Sunday excursion, uh, these rather dour-looking ladies from Carlisle. Um, no doubt this photograph is interesting to them, but what I'm trying to find out is what about the structures? There appears to be a pavilion back here. Uh, you can learn things even by just looking at how big the trees are. Maybe there's a sign. You couldn't never quite read that. Unfortunately, most of these photographs didn't reveal anything useful for my purposes. There were two images showing the infrastructure of Pine Grove Park uh, that uh, we could pull up in the uh, photo archives. This one shows a very nice footbridge crossing Mountain Creek. So this is looking upstream because that playing field is here and the railroad would be just off the left edge going towards the furnace, and you can see the edge of a building or two there. Very interesting, the other one was kind of a gold mine. It shows the dam that created that two-acre lake along the channel of Mountain Creek. You can see a boat there, and um, you can tell that people were able to walk across the top of the dam. So this led me to think, well, where else do we have information? And it turns out, if you look very carefully at the poster, there's some wonderful drawings, some engraved images in the middle of the poster. And that's what I'd like to turn attention to now. And if you haven't had a chance to look at this up close, you don't have to because I copied these three images and they're in your handouts. <laughs> the first one uh, at the top is partly just you know, generic images, what we call clip art today. Uh, I don't think they had the term back then, maybe they did. Uh, but here's a picnic table, it's kind of useless. But in the background, we see that dam, and we see the railroad that would have been stopping right at the park stop, and then continuing onward to the end of the line of the furnace. And we see some people in boats. And sure enough, if I overlay the photograph, the one photograph we have of the dam, it really resembles the drawing quite closely. So I thought that was interesting. The main large image in the middle of the poster uh, shows again the railroad track in the front. In the back we have some of the buildings and it's worth careful study because as I looked more and more at this, I started to think whoever drew these either had access to the, the pictures we wish we had today or probably actually visited the spot. These are not generic images. They appear to be matching the documentary evidence and the few photographs very closely. On the um, on the left side, we see the dam again and some boats. I think that lake is not nearly as wide in reality, but there you go. It is, it is advertising after all. And on the right side, you can see that they're playing baseball, exactly as the promotional stuff described. And at first, I thought this was the 200 yard shooting range, but that didn't make sense because you'd be shooting people. And, and, and I think this is just completely wrong. And that's a point I'll come back to also in just a minute. And there appears to be a very small bandstand that people are watching the ball game while they're waiting for the train. The third image shows a bunch of buildings in the back. In particular, there's a log house, and I wonder if that might be the ladies' toilets. I don't know. Um, and we also see off on the right side the uh, flying horses and merry-go-round going counterclockwise, appropriate for an American and not a European merry-go-round. The woman sitting in the front is kind of just thrown in there. She looks very sad to me. In some ways, these um, engravings, drawings, the people are the weak part, and I find that very interesting. The artist is obviously hugely talented, but the, the figures are a little rough, and I don't know why this woman actually appears to be frowning, but there you go. So again, this makes me wonder, who is it that made these drawings? Well, if you look very, very, very closely, underneath the bowling alley, the ten pins, the name Longacre appears. There are no first initials, just to make it a challenge for us 100 years later, but it does say L-O-N-G-A-C-R-E. Okay, who's Longacre? So here's some speculation courtesy of Google. Um, I have not had a chance to do the art history work that's really needed here, but I suspect there's gotta be records in Philadelphia that might help us out. Um, it turns out that the Longacre family of Philadelphia and also New York City 
included several generations of artists, and interestingly enough, their focus through the generations tended to be on engravings and miniatures, exactly the sort of thing that we might see in this poster. And the family also included a prominent Methodist minister. So could there be a connection to Jackson Fuller and Jay Cook and Pine Grove Furnace and so forth? Well, I would note that Jay Cook was very religious, and he lived in Philadelphia. And indeed, I found, again, courtesy of Google, um, several indications that the families must have known each other. In particular, Jay Cook and the, I'll call him the paterfamilias of the Long Acres, served together on the American Sunday School Union in the 1850s and 60s. And so this is circumstantial, but it suggests to me that the Long Acre who drew this uh, poster, these wonderful little miniatures, must have been a member of the family. And here's just proof of this. We've got Jay Cook serving on one committee after he was a manager in 1857, and here's James B. Longacre on a committee, and also he was one of the vice presidents for that group. James Barton Longacre is well known as the engraver, uh, the chief of the mint in Philadelphia, and he's the guy who did the famous Indian head penny. In fact, there's a apparently false story that it was based on his granddaughter. Several of his descendants became well-known artists. James Barton Longacre died way too early to be responsible for this poster, but I wonder, just circumstantial evidence, whether his son or either of his grandkids. His granddaughter, Lydia, would have been very young in the early 1880s when this poster was made, but it's not impossible that they brought her in. She really was the talented artist of his descendants. She became um, uh, well-known as a miniature painter. She studied with Whistler in Paris. And in fact, her works are in the collections today of the Smithsonian and also of the Metropolitan Museum in New York. So I wonder if even at a very young age, only about 11 years old, she might have done this. I don't know. I think we could find that answer with some more. So what happened to Congrove Park? It went into decline. Uh, just apparently lack of initiative. The furnace was out of operation, as I'll tell you in a moment. A December 1903 newspaper said, Pine Grove Park no more. The vast mountain fires of the past summer and that before. So in other words, during the summer of 1903 and the summer of 1902, have wrought considerable damage to the once beautiful and popular Pine Grove Park. Now it is in a deplorable state. So the exact year that it went out of operation is a little unclear. Uh, Randy, I think you struggled with this when you were writing your booklet. It seems around 1900, 1901, thereabouts that it really stopped being used. And this 1903 newspaper article says they were going to cut down the trees because I guess they've all been damaged by the forest fire. Meanwhile, it was the end of an era. In a bigger way, the iron furnace was out of operation by April of 1895. And uh, of course, they were competing with steel production. They only made iron there. So they're competing with steel on a vastly larger scale. And the fact that they kept it going for the last 15 or 20 years is really remarkable. Jackson Fuller died at the Iron Master's Mansion, his residence at Pine Grove Furnace in October 1904. And only four months later, Jay Cook died in February of 1905 in Philadelphia. So it was really the end of the era in many ways. Discussions began, it appears, even by the following year with the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. It took a while, probably because of the panic of 1907, there were financial downturn. Uh, finally, the Commonwealth came up with enough money to purchase this particular set of iron company lands. They had already been doing that for the other iron companies up and down the South Mountains. And uh, they ended up with what is today the middle part of the Michaux State Forest. At the time, it was called the Pine Grove Division of the South Mountain Forest. The name Michaux Forest didn't come in until the very early 1920s. A footnote to all of this is that they actually did talk about renewing the amusement park. And if you know that Caledonia State Park today has a public golf course, would it not have been amazing if there was a public amusement park at Pine Grove? But it was not to be. This newspaper article is one of your handouts. And I, it's worth reading. It's worth taking a few minutes. It's, it's full of bluster and optimism, and it just didn't happen. So when the Commonwealth took over the property, things were in really dire shape. And they could have gone in a number of different directions, um, but the amusement park was not one of them. That area was still used, though, for recreation. And thanks to Barb Landis, I think I've understood what you've said, that um, Camp Sells uh, in 1913 and 1914 was more or less in the same place as the amusement park had been. 
Also in the 1930s, there was a Girl Scout swimming pool that was built there. And you can still see that. This photograph was just taken last year. It's completely filled in with dirt and barberries. Uh, but it's up on a little bit of a hill, and I'm puzzled because the way that land is laid out, I don't know exactly where that playing field was that they you know, show in the drawings, but it was somewhere very close to where the swimming pool would have been. If you look across Mountain Creek from that area, um, where the main amusement park, 30 acres, was, there are some concrete foundations. I do not know if these date back to 1878 and onward, or if they're much more recent. I really would love to have that answered. And the rest of the area is just completely overgrown woods. I've gone back and forth through there, and all I can find is barberry. Once in a while I find a few foundations, some of which I know to be from the 1950s, and some others that I can't figure out what they were, but I doubt if they go back to the original Pine Grove Park. So that's what it looks like today. It's really sad that we don't have that. So uh, on that note, let me stop. And if there's any comments or questions, I'd be happy to chat with the audience. Thank you. We don't know what happened to any of this, really. Um, it's very sad. Uh, we got excited a few years ago. Rachel saw something online, and it said Pine Grove, and it seemed to be referring to one of the flying horses, but it was not from this Pine Grove. It was the one up in Spokane County. We looked at it more closely. It's very frustrating. Uh, all of this infrastructure disappeared. Knowing them, they probably tried to sell it off because they, they sold anything that wasn't nailed down in the later years. Uh, the swimming pool you were talking about, is that, was there a foundation for that? Did you find that? The swimming pool is really obvious if you know where to look for it. Um, if you uh, go from Fuller Lake towards Laurel on the Hiker Biker Trail, which in that area is actually still part of the Appalachian Trail also. So you can take a little stroll on the Appalachian Trail, it's completely flat, gravel, it's very easy. And you go just a couple minutes from Fuller Lake towards Laurel, and off to the side, there's a little elevated area, and there's a, a kind of obvious informal trail. It's maybe 20 steps off to the side. And, and so that, that swimming pool is there. It's, uh, you walk up to it, and you, you look at it and say, gee, that's a swimming pool. It was a large swimming pool. I mean, it was there in 1949. Um, it was cold. It, well, it, it was very cold. <laughs> we were in it. Well, it's, it's still very much there. It was built, apparently, I believe, in the very early 1930s. Um, the state... Uh, Department of Environmental Protection's uh, dam safety uh, folks, they have some interesting records that I've gone through. And they still have on their books the little tiny dam that's a couple hundred yards upstream that fed water into the swimming pool. And that dam is still there. Um, it's confusing because you might think it's part of Pine Grove Park, but it was very clearly built to fill the swimming pool. Uh, and the fact that the swimming pool is elevated the way it is is interesting. They obviously wanted it out of the Mountain Creek floodplain. It's not obvious that you would choose to do it that way, but they did. It was a Girl Scout camp. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, um, did, does anyone know how long did you see? I, I know it continued for a number of years. How long was it in service? Do we know well, the end? I was there in 1949. Okay. I think. So they've been there for almost 20 years at that point. It was, it was, it was, a, it was a nightmare. <laughs> it was a nightmare camp. It was, we stayed in, in tents, and uh, we had a latrine that we had to put stuff into. You didn't have a nice log cabin. There, there must we be signs of that. Well, yeah, we had well, it's possible that some of the um, very limited foundations that are still back on the hillside relate to that use of the area. But it's been used over and over again through the decades. You know. Does anyone know, 1950s, 1960s, is it possible that Girl Scout swimming pool was used much past that era? Um, I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, it was used in the early 1950s. Okay. So still into the 1950s. Okay. Early, early. Early. Yeah. And maybe long, right? No, do I hear 50s? Do I hear 60s? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, 1950s? Fifty-three. Okay. Well, 
if, if you have a chance to go back there, look and see if it's the same one that you remember, you do definitely have to walk up a very small slope that's elevated above Mountain Creek property, which is why they had to fill it from a special dam upstream a few hundred yards. So, well, thanks, I've learned something that's pushing the case back. Yes? How many people worked at the amusement park? No idea. I don't think, Randy, do you remember ever seeing anything about that? Uh, no clue. Did Indian school kids go up there? I'm um, repeating your, your comment. That's an interesting point because the years fit, don't they? And they went up, they did have camps up there, up at what I believe where Tumbling Rocks are. I think they camped up there. Okay, that's a few miles further uh, south and west. Yeah. That's an interesting question. Could there be other connections besides Camp Cells to that area? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, so Pine Grove Park started roughly in the same era as the Indian School. Yeah. Right? Yeah, so I hadn't made that connection before. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, that Laurel Lake, is that an iron pit too? No, Laurel Lake was created as Laurel Forge Pond to provide water power for the forge there. So of the two lakes in on the iron property in the state park today, Fuller was the pit, the quarry, and it got to almost 90 feet deep, give or take, when they stopped using it. And that's why even to this day it's very deep and cold and frankly dangerous. Laurel Lake is very shallow in most places uh, by comparison because it had a completely different reason for existence. They're both man-made, but in very different ways. Both of them, though, connected to the iron industry. Are there still railroad cars down in, Laurel, in uh, Pine Grove Lake? <laughs> um, it, a rumor that we got yeah. it filled up so fast okay. that they were stuck there. Yes. Now you're into some interesting stuff. If we have time, I'll keep no, going. This is a great thing. Um, just two weeks ago, uh, we had the annual fall festival where we do the hairy hand fake ghost story. Uh, and part of that story, it ties into what you just asked, was whether Fuller filled so quickly that there's still stuff in the bottom. Well, there is stuff in the bottom, but it's not because it filled so quickly. And the whole idea that a uh, uh, quarry worker, a uh, miner, got caught down there and drowned is complete fiction. Um, when they got deep enough, they started having water problems repeatedly through the decades at what is now Fuller Lake. Uh, Birkenbein, John Birkenbein, the engineer who was brought in in 1877, reported that he found it about 70 feet deep at that point, and he said there were three springs in the bottom that provided 250 gallons a minute of water together. Now that sounds like a huge amount of water, but it's also a very, very big hole in the ground. And I did some very rough calculations and figured it probably took two to three months just based on those three springs. Adding some rain, uh, flow off the hillsides, it would be a little faster than that. But it would take a couple months to fill up, not a deluge. It's not Noah's flood. So there are things left in the bottom, but it's simply because they abandoned them. They just left them there. Because it was easier not to get them out. And some things you can sell and some not going to get anything, so they just left them. So there are occasionally scuba divers who go in there with permission, uh, and they pull out garbage, but they also occasionally find things. I've seen some videos just a few years ago where you can see some platforms that were clearly part of the quarrying operation. Um, and there, there's carts down there. They did pull up at least one almost attacked cart at one point. Wheels come up occasionally from the 19th century. There's tools down there, yeah. But, but it wasn't because the waters rushed in and they all had to come screaming out of there. And, you know, the hairy hand story is that one of the workers went back to get his wife's pumpkin pie and got trapped. And now every Halloween, his hand comes out of the wall. So if you've never seen that, you should come next October. It's going to be the third. Friends group is running it now. It's the third weekend of next uh, October. And see us making charcoal. We have other history demos. And you can listen to the hairy hand on Saturday. So, anyone else? Spoiler. <laughs> yeah, spoiler. The hairy hand comes up. Um, and we, we actually have a huge plywood hand with glow sticks. <laughs> Don't tell the children. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for your attention.